Functions are powerful things in Swift. Yes, you've seen how you can create them, pass parameters into them, return values from them, and more. But you can also assign functions to variables, pass functions into functions, and even return functions from functions. For example, let's say we've got a function here called greet user that just prints hi there when it's called, and we call it as greet user. That's easy enough. But we're then going to say this, var greet copy equals greet user, and then greet copy. So we're taking a copy of the function and putting it into greet copy, and then calling the copy of the function. And it'll print the same message. It'll print hi there twice. Now this is important. You can see on the var greet copy equals greet user line, when you are copying a function, you don't write parentheses after the function. So it's not greet user open and close parens, it's just greet user by itself. If you put the parentheses there, it means run the function, then put its return value into greet copy. Without the parentheses, it means, you know, copy the function directly. Give me another handle to the same function. But what if you wanted to skip creating a separate function using func greet user, yada, 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 yada. You just want to assign some functionality directly to a constant or variable. Well, it turns out you can do that too. And here's how it looks. Let say hello equals open brace, print hi there, end brace. And now we can call say hello freely. Now Swift gives this the grandiose name of a closure expression, which means we just created a closure. That is a chunk of code, some functionality, we can pass around like a function and call whenever we want. This one here doesn't have a function name attached to it. It's just being put directly into a constant. But otherwise, it's effectively the same as a function that takes no parameters and returns nothing at all. Now, if you want the closure to accept parameters, they've got to be written in a slightly special way. If you think about it, the closure starts with the open brace and closes with a close brace. That's where it runs. So we can't put code outside the brace. The closure starts with the open and closes with the close. It's all inside there is our closure. And so Swift has a neat workaround. We put the information, parameter types coming in, names coming in, and return value going out inside the braces like this. So inside the brace, name string, return string in. Now, there's an extra keyword in there, which I'm sure you spotted. It is right here, the in keyword. And it comes directly after the parameters and the return type of our closure. Again, with a regular function, the parameters and the return type would come outside the braces. Func, some function, parens, name string, whatever, return string, open braces starts there. But we can't do that with closures. So we've got to put it inside the braces. And so in, this keyword in, is a marker. It marks the end of the parameters and return type and the start of the body of the closure, the actual functionality that we want to run. There's a reason for it, and you'll see it for yourself soon enough. In the meantime, you might have a more fundamental question. You're thinking to yourself, why would I ever need these things? And I get it. Closures seem awfully obscure. And worse, they're obscure and seem complicated. Many, many people struggle to learn closures when they first meet them. They are complex beasts. They seem like they're never going to be useful. However, as you'll see in the coming days, as you learn more about Swift, they are used extensively in Swift. And they're used everywhere in Swift UI. You'll use them in the very first Swift UI app you write. You will use closures. And in every one you write going forward, sometimes hundreds of times you will use closures. Maybe not in the exact form you see here, but you'll be using them a lot. To get an idea of why they're useful, I want to backtrack a little bit and look at function types. You've seen how an integer is an int, a decimal is a double, 
True or false, that's a bull, so forth. And now I want you to think about how functions themselves have a type. Let's take greet user we wrote earlier. This one here, func greet user. Da, da, da. When we say var greet copy equals greet user, what would be the type annotation for greet copy? This is a function that accepts no parameters and returns no value and does not throw errors. And if we were to write out an explicit type annotation for greet copy, we'd say this our greet copy colon open and close parens returns void. Let's break it down. The empty parens marks a function that accepts no parameters. The arrow next to it means exactly what it means when you make a function. We're about to declare the return type for the function. And void, void is a special word meaning nothing. This function returns no value. Sometimes you will see this written as open and close parens. Behind the scenes, void and open and close parens mean the same thing. Nothing's coming back. But we usually avoid that, but we avoid writing open and close and prefer using void because it can be confusing with parameters. You know, open and close returns open and close. It's like, which is which? Um, so having it as open and close returns void is clearer. But occasionally in, say, Xcode's code completion, for example, you might see... Uh, open and close parens in place of void. Now, every function's type depends on the data it receives, the parameters it has coming in, and also the values it sends back. That might sound simple, but it's an important catch because the, the types matter. What am I going to accept? Some strings, integer, array of strings. What do I return back? A tuple of a string, integer, whatever. Stuff, right? The names don't matter. The names of the data it receives are not part of the function's type. Only the data types are part of the function's type. And we can see this with some more code, like this. We can say func get user data for id int return string. So this function here, get user data, accepts one integer parameter called for externally and id internally and returns a string. That's its type. Accept int, return string. And if we were to write it out as a type annotation, like getting a copy of this, for example, we'd say this. Let data is a function that takes an int, returns a string, equals get user data. And then we can go ahead and call it. So it starts off easily enough. This is a function that takes an int, returns a string, but when we copy it, the type is accept int, returns string. It does not include the for external keyword there. It's just int and string. And so when the copy is called, the name information is lost. We just say data 1989, not data for 1989. So the names have gone. Now, cunningly, this actually applies to all closures behind the scenes. You might have noticed I didn't call the say hello closure when it took a, a, a parameter earlier. Uh, that's intentional. I don't want to leave you questioning why it's missing a parameter name and so forth. So let's call it now. We say, say hello, Taylor. Even though it's clearly got the name thing coming in, we don't say, say hello, name Taylor, just say hello, Taylor. So again, there's no parameter name for these closures or function copies and similar. They're the same thing. They're only used when calling a function directly. If I had a function, say hello, name string, as I say hello name string, fine. But we create a closure or take a copy of the function first, we don't use it. Now, even with the extra explanation, there's a very good chance you're still wondering why all this matters. And I hope it's about to become clear. Do you remember I said, when we call sorted on an array, we get items sorted alphabetically or numeric or whatever, and it sorts elements of the array. It means we can write code like this. If I go to Xcode, I could say, uh, let team equals, I'll do array of strings using Gloria and Suzanne and Piper, and we'll do Tiffany, and we'll do Tasha. I can now sort that. Let sorted team equals team.sorted, and then print sorted team. 
And we'll get back that same list sorted alphabetically. Gloria, Piper, Suzanne, Tasha, Tiffany. And that's really neat. But what if we wanted control over that sort? What if we wanted one person to come first because they were the team captain with the rest being sorted alphabetically? Well, when you call sorted, it actually allows us to pass in a custom sorting function. We're calling the function sorted, passing in a function to it as a parameter. And it lets us control the sort. And it, it actually, this function we pass in must take two parameters, in our case, two strings, because it's a string array, and it will return true if the first string should come before the second string. That's what it does. Otherwise, false. So false if first should be after second. Uh, so we could say, if you wanted Suzanne to come first no matter what, right? We'd say something like this. Uh, let's make a function. Funk captain first sorted. Name one string and name two string returns bool. And again, this should return true if name one should come before name two. Otherwise, return false. Now, I want Suzanne to come first. So I'll say if name one is equal to Suzanne, then return true. Suzanne should come before everybody else. Else if name two is Suzanne, then return false. So we're saying uh, name two should come before name one, if, it, if name two is Suzanne. If we're still here, then neither of the two things we're looking at is Suzanne. We'll do a regular alphabetical sort. We'll say return name one is less than name two. And that's our custom sorting function done. It'll sort so Suzanne always comes first. So again, if the first name is Suzanne, go ahead and say yes, name one should come before name two. If name two is Suzanne, return false. No, name one should not come before name two. Name two should come before name one. Otherwise, do a regular sort. And like I said, when you call sorted, you can pass in a function to create a custom sort order. How do you want to do sorts? And as long as that thing accepts two strings coming in and returns a Boolean, sorted can use it. That's exactly what our new captain's first sorted function does. Two strings coming in, Boolean going out. So I'll now say, let captain first team equals team dot sorted. And you'll see there's a by version here I want to use, and I'll call this uh, by captain first sorted, like that. And now print captain first team. Let's print that out. Boom. So Suzanne now comes first, then Gloria, Piper, Tasha, and Tiffany. So these are all alphabetical, apart from Suzanne, who's now pushed to the front no matter what. Exactly as expected. And we've now covered what I think are two very different things, or at least seem to be very different things. First, we can create closures as anonymous functions and just stash them away in constants and variables like this kind of code here. It's a closure expression, putting this functionality into say hello, so we can call it here. Uh, here, sorry. You've also seen how we can pass functions like captain first sorted into other functions freely, if it's allowed to. The power of closures is that we can put these two things together. Sorted wants a function that will take two strings and return a Boolean, that's here. And it doesn't care whether we pass into that a dedicated function, you know, func captain first sorted, or whether it's provided using a closure. We can do either one, it doesn't care as long as it takes two values and returns a Boolean. And so we could call sorted again, but rather than try to pass in the captain first team function, we wrote up here, this is this thing. Instead, we'll start an inline closure, a new closure, write an open brace, list parameters, and return type, write in, and then put our standard function code. I'm gonna warn you, this is likely to hurt your brain when you first see it. It is not because you aren't smart enough, you're not cut out for Swift programming or whatever. Only that closures 
are really hard. Don't worry. We're going to look at ways to make it easier. If you're finding it hard, it's a good sign things are working normally. So, let's comment out this code. So it's not going to work anymore. It's not going to be activated anymore. I'll write some new code. This time using a closure. We'll say let captain first team equals team dot sorted by here. And now our closure's here. We can say it takes name one string, name two string, returns a bool in. And at this point, it's basically our same code. Grab all this stuff from here, paste it on into here, boom. So it's the same code for sorting. Name one string comes in, name two string comes in, return a bool, it's the same logic otherwise. And now after that runs, I'll print captain first team again, like that. Now the inline closure sorting. And it's still Suzanne, Gloria, Piper, Tasha, Tiffany. Now, this is a big chunk of syntax all at once. This is a very complicated first piece of code to see when you're just learning closures. I want to say again, it's going to get easier. In the very next video, we're going to look at all sorts of ways to reduce the amount of syntax you can see in your screen so it's easier to see what's going on here. But first, I want to break down what's happening here. We are still calling the sorted function on team. But rather than passing in a standalone function defined separately like up here, instead, we're passing in a closure. Everything from this brace here down to this closing brace down here, everything after buy, is the closure. That's it right there. Now, directly inside the closure here, that's where we list the data coming in and data going out. So it takes a string and a string, name one, name two, and returns a Boolean. We mark the end of that and the start of the main closure body with in. Everything after in, blah, 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 down to here. Just normal function code, literally copied across from our original function here. So, again, there's a lot of syntax here, and I wouldn't blame you if you just felt a headache coming on, okay? But I hope you're seeing a little bit of the benefits of closures, at least it's a little glimmer of it, because functions like sorted, they let us pass in custom code to adjust how they work. And if you want to, you can do so directly with an inline closure. You don't have to, you can use a function if you want to, but inline works brilliantly for our code. We haven't got to write out a new function every single time we want to just do one thing. Just well, every single time, a unique usage, new function again and again, it'd be quite tiresome. That is just smaller, simpler, and nicer to read. So now you understand what closures are, let's see if we can make them easier to read.